Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you're doing well. It is Monday, the 11th of January. Uh, hope all your friends and family are safe and sound given everything that's going on. Uh, and a couple of things then to, to have a look at in this briefing, basically an update of the roundup of the weekend news, uh, a quick look at some of the major themes to be aware of, uh, and also what is the market sentiment here at the open this morning. Uh, before I begin, uh, don't forget, we've had some really great uh, exclusive content for our community on Amplify Live, so do check that out in the link below, or if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel, it would be much appreciated. Uh, but look, let's get straight into it and look at the charts this morning, and continuation of dollar strength at the moment, the Dixie's trading up about 0.3%, that has weighed on both major currency pairs here in Euro dollar and cable, a little bit lower at the moment, uh, cable in the future is down around the 135 handle, underperforming its Euro counterpart slightly on the back of still a little bit of apprehension of the potential for further falls coming more stringent lockdown in the UK. Um, otherwise elsewhere, um, stock futures moderately lower, albeit very marginally so. Uh, nothing more, I'd say, than perhaps a little bit of profit taking given the run up to all time highs uh, last week. The overnight Asia Pacific session generally was, was mixed. Japan was out on a market holiday. Uh, Chinese inflation figures, CPI 0.2% year on year, above the expected 0.1 on CPI. PPI minus 0.4% against the expected minus 0.8, not really. Um, any impact or read across into the, the UK European Open. Uh, otherwise, elsewhere, the 10 year T notes bottom right uh, are trading flat at the moment. So, no real new definable yield movement seen as yet. Uh, gold, a little bit of pressure seen at the recommencement of trade in the overnight session, uh, however, has just gradually recovered, um, running into some near term resistance here in the futures at around 52, 1852 being the recommencement high seen overnight and the low on Friday afternoon, uh, but up around $9 at the moment. Again, it was beaten down significantly last week on the uh, rising yields on the back of the blue wave, uh, which was the most dominant theme, of course. Uh, in the crude market, fairly similar price pattern, in fact, to what we've seen in the equity space. Not really one definable uh, piece of news or anything new related to OPEC per se, but bit of profit taking perhaps on the extremity of the uh, run up that we had last week where obviously we had a surprise Saudi cut in production, still a degree of optimism over the demand side on the rollout of the vaccines globally. And so we hit the peak on a daily here at 52.75, just backing off a little bit, uh, but looking for some support lower down from these previous levels we can see going back to 2019 if we were to pull down to uh, kind of 50-50 in the $50 handle area as, as being supportive going forward. Uh, the other market that has probably seen the most movement this morning uh, is Bitcoin, not something I'd typically look at, but obviously it's had such a big phenomenal run to kick off the year. I mean, if we go back to where we were on the 31st of December to the high that we saw at the end of last week, we've saw the best part of a gain of nearly 50%. But if you look at it from that point to where we are this morning, which is uh, literally just the weekend trade and uh, and this morning the first couple of hours we're already down close to 23% of the low so uh, I hope any new traders haven't been caught out there um, you know, getting involved given all the hysteria that Bitcoin was creating last week just the nature of the product I guess in that sense uh, but look let's delve straight into some of the headlines and talk about what we've got to look out for this week don't forget in terms of the technical analysis and the trade setups, the guys are going to go over that in full on the live stream on Amplify Live, so don't forget to, to check that out. But getting straight into some of the headlines, I'm going to start off with talking about the UK uh, and COVID-19, uh, and Britain is on course to have immunised its most vulnerable people against COVID-19 by mid-February, uh, so far around a third have been done. Uh, and they are aiming to offer a shot to every adult by the autumn, with some 2 million people having already received their first dose. That was according to Matt Hancock, the health secretary in the UK. Um, so remember, mid-February was the deadline they had previously issued. Some question marks on whether or not that is going to be hit, just given the relatively slow adoption uh, of the vaccines at the moment being administered, particularly with the likes of 
some of the things we were discussing last week. It's not that Astra can come in and start just offering millions upon millions uh, virals of the vaccine. It doesn't quite work like that from a manufacturing perspective. So it's going to take some time. The speeds it seemingly has started to pick up. Uh, the number of UK vaccination, what they're, the government are calling mega centres, is set to also pick up pace in locations like sports stadiums and conference centres across the country uh, as of the coming weeks. That's what's in the plan and in the pipeline at the moment as they look to really uh, build out the speed of that uh, inoculation programme. Uh, so that all sounds uh, very positive. Now, I guess the main thing I'd look for here is uh, really whenever we've had a government put forward a timetable for this type of thing, they've nearly always inherently missed it. They always tend to err on the side of uh, optimism, positivity, whatever you want to call it. So there's always room then for disappointment in that regard. And already, as we were hearing last week, I don't think it would be much a surprise at all to see the current state of the lockdown rolled out as far as even Easter, which would be uh, the beginning of April. And remember that the government was looking to uh, tentatively look to review the current status of the UK lockdown around mid-February on the week of the 15th to then uh, make any alterations on the week of the 22nd. But I would say that's probably a little early at this point, all things remaining equal, and particularly when we start to, as we can see on this graphic, look at some of the actual COVID-19 case rates, hospitalizations and death counts, uh, I would say it's more like that's going to be rolled over. Secondly to that as well, I'm sure you saw lots of shots in national press over the weekend about uh, just the public's lack of adherence on quite a large scale to the current state of the lockdown. Um, and what that's leading to then is uh, a lot of difficulty given uh, mobility rates are generally quite a bit higher than comparative to the lockdown that we saw in March, which obviously was fairly effective on getting on top of the virus at the time. This time round, uh, a more lack of adherence to the, the stringency of those rules uh, in combination with a more transmissible virus and this new variant of, the, of COVID-19 has meant that uh, there's some talk now starting to emerge that the government could take more strict measures with this lockdown. There was a meeting apparently between UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson um, last night. However, the latest there that I've heard from government insiders have insisted that the immediate priority is to enforce the existing rules. Uh, a lot of that rationale being based upon there hasn't been enough time yet to see whether this latest lockdown in its current form has paid dividend or not, and therefore does it need alteration. Uh, but that's definitely something which could have some ramification. Obviously, Brexit has been a little bit of a side issue. Uh, the COVID-19, uh, the virus itself, and also then the subsequent lockdowns are still the major thing here which is influencing um, kind of global assets but particularly in the UK is very uh, acute at this point of time just given the fact that this number here the COVID cases and deaths is generally underreported at the weekend so today's number could be definitely one to account for and you probably read at the weekend as well uh, a lot of the NHS trusts particularly in London I think it was 16 out of 21 of them uh, over basically re breaching their safety thresholds which is around 92% of capacity. Uh, and so a lot of these things are obviously very troubling. Uh, and uh, again, the, the read across for, for Sterling here at the moment, I would say is in the coming days, if these numbers continue to get higher and quite drastically show, uh, so, uh, and the public continue to show uh, a general, uh, on average, a lack of respect for adhering to these rules, then it's almost inevitable that two things, the lockdown is going to get more strict and it's going to go on for longer. And that is going to have some economic impacts over the medium term, um, medium term in my world, I'd say the coming weeks and therefore probably needs to be reflected in the price of sterling. Particularly as well, don't forget with cable, it's been relatively high, of course, with the fairly smooth Brexit situation. And so there's room for some downside, particularly in the context of not only those negative developing fundamentals for the pound, but in the context of a resurgent dollar, at least in the short term, on the back of repositioning for the somewhat surprise of the blue wave from last week. Uh, so that's, that's the latest there. Um, talking about uh, Trump, so there's been a lot of headline news, of course, given that uh, pretty shocking episode that happened on Capitol Hill last week. Uh, Democrats will launch a second attempt to remove Donald Trump from office today. 
they will introduce articles of impeachment to the House. The Senate will not reconvene until the 19th um, of this month, so still some time. Senate Republican leader, though, Mitch McConnell, already said on Friday, uh, to give you some context, that a trial cannot begin before then unless all 100 senators consent to it, which is an exceedingly unlikely development, as Trump obviously still has a number of, uh, despite all that's gone on, all the criticism he's faced, he still has some supporters within the Republican Party. Um, separate to that, a growing number of Republicans over the weekend, particularly on Sunday, have criticised the president for his role, uh, but none of them have said that they would vote to convict him of wrongdoing in the Senate. So um, my overall take here with this whole impeachment thing, uh, invoking uh, the 25th Amendment and so on, uh, I think it's all just quite frankly noise, again, with the greatest uh, kind of sympathy and sensitivity to the event and the people's lives who were impacted uh, last week and what that means for democracy and so on. That aside, uh, as far as markets are concerned, I think impeachment is not going to happen. Uh, even if it does get brought about, it's not going to go through. We've been here before. Uh, and so it's all a bit of a distraction and one I'd probably say is, is, is one to be ignored, at least for the time being, all things being equal. Uh, reports have suggested, though, that obviously time is ticking now and Trump and his dwindling circle of advisers, they are believed to be planning a defiant final week in office, according to people close to the matter. Uh, Trump is believed to be preparing at least one more round of pardons uh, and also will try a final time to advance his administration's efforts against uh, big tech obviously probably somewhat now even more motivated to do so given his censorship silencing he's had from the likes of Twitter uh, and Facebook in particular. Um, what does this all mean for markets? I mean I've made a note here to myself that uh, I don't think a great deal from, from a trading perspective but politically um, I think it is very meaningful uh, between an impeachment movement uh, and as I said Trump's censorship by social media I think political Polarization is not going away any time soon, uh, and neither is Donald Trump going away any time soon. Uh, that's even despite the the blue wave that's happened at the moment. So, yeah, a lot of it's an interesting time uh, in the U.S. politics. A lot of challenges being met, and there's a lot of social division at the moment. I don't think any of these kind of topics are going to go away. But from a market's perspective, I would say there's there's other things much more important right now like COVID-19 uh, to, to be confronted with. The other thing we're looking out for this week then, and this moves on uh, to the other big thing aside from COVID and vaccines, which is Biden's stimulus plan, obviously the blue wave now with the Democrats having full control of both chambers of Congress is, is going to be influential. Uh, and President-elect Biden is due to outline his stimulus plans on Thursday. Uh, Biden has guided that the price tag will be high and in the trillions and is expected to include plans for a $2,000 stimulus checks and more generous unemployment assistance and enhanced aid to city and state government. So again, this is what, why the market was behaving in the way that it did last week with equities all-time highs, with yields breaching the 10% in the 10-year, gold coming under pressure. There's a lot of pre-positioning for this, so seeing the details around it is going to be particularly interesting to see that's going to come on Thursday. Uh, otherwise, let's just take a look at the calendar for this week and kicking off today, it's a fairly quiet day. Uh, there are a couple of speakers that definitely warrant monitoring. Uh, the bolded one here, you can see ECB President Christine Lagarde moderates a panel later today. That's going to be at 4, uh, 2.40 excuse me, London time. Um, worth noting that this is Lagarde's first public appearance since the new year, 2021. She speaks both today and Wednesday and may provide some clues then for implications for monetary policy given the current state at the moment of the European economy, developments on COVID that we've had, given there's been a relative silence from them for a few weeks over the Christmas New Year period. Um, this then will be accompanied by the ECB minutes, which we're going to get on Thursday. Uh, separate to that, one thing to be aware of is that uh, Jerome Powell is also speaking uh, this week and he's speaking on Thursday and he's taking part in the Princeton Economics webinar. 
so not expecting too much there, but just wanted to bring it to your attention that the ECB president and the Fed chair will be speaking this week. So Monday, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, otherwise, looking further forward, uh, Tuesday's economic data slate, yeah, relatively quiet, not really too much to speak of. So then we're going to Wednesday when we do get the US CPI. So from a data perspective, uh, you do have US CPI on Wednesday and you've also got US retail sales on Friday. Now, which, uh, weekly jobless claims as well will be another one to be monitored, just given the impact that further restrictions in the US are having, given the situation uh, of COVID. Um, retail sales probably fell for a third straight month, is what analysts are expecting. Uh, the auto and gasoline components likely rose, but spending in bars, restaurants probably plunged, as you would imagine, given the renewed COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, inflation, so the figure we're going to see on on Wednesday from the US is likely to move higher on gasoline prices, uh, but outside of that, price pressures, as you can imagine, remain relatively benign at the moment in the US. Again, with consumer confidence generally uh, decreasing and with the overall state of uh, the economic environment and activity at this present point in time. Uh, one other thing you might have mentioned here or you might have seen here on this calendar is there's quite a few Bank of England speakers You've got Tenreiro speaking, and quite interestingly, on the topic of negative rates, remember last week, just given some of the developments that we saw with COVID-19, um, that the money markets have been bringing forward the pricing in of the potential for negative rates further into near term to August and the summer of this year. Um, and Tenreiro, what can we expect today? She's speaking at 2 p.m. London time. I don't think a great deal. She's been an advocate of it on the relative success as she sees it that it's had in likes of Japan uh, and the ECB. Personally, I think she's just being used as a bit of a, a pawn by the MPC to just plant the seed of the idea that the Bank of England are willing to seriously entertain it as a tool rather than anything uh, more than that is my, my kind of view. So I'd expect her to be fairly similar to what she said before. Then you've got Bank of England's Broadbent gives a speech on COVID and the composition of spending. Um, Broadbent is the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, so I wouldn't expect him to deviate too far from the general uh, party line at this point in time, but probably both could be quite interesting to, to watch going, going forward. Um, general consensus here is that as much as negative interest rates, given the situation, um, is, is quite challenging at the moment in the UK due to COVID-19. Uh, and obviously a lot of it will be hinged on the effectiveness of the rollout program of the vaccine. Um, but there's a step stone pro approach to monetary policy, don't forget. And so things like uh, more incentives for banks to lend under the term funding scheme, uh, a faster pace of uh, bond buying under the QE, the asset purchase program, are all probably steps to take before then adopting that of negative rates. Um, so that's just giving you a bit of context as to, as to things. Um, so that is pretty much it. That is the week as a whole. So overall, it is fairly quiet in terms of um, a number of major economic data points, certainly not as busy as, as last week. The main thing is probably US CPI Wednesday, um, jobless claims Thursday, retail sales Friday, number of um, central bank speakers throughout the week, including then, as I said, Lagarde and Powell. Uh, and then, then the other big thing, of course, that continues to be a dominant effect is COVID-19. Uh, the situation in the US, mainland Europe and the UK needs to be monitored. Uh, any talk about rolling out or more stringent lockdowns could be impactful. Of course, looking out for uh, any updates on the vaccine with the tail risk being disruptions to manufacturing and distribution, which might have a negative effect. And then looking out for Joe Biden at the end of the week to roll out the details of what he intends to do now uh, with his blue control with the latest stimulus measures when he comes into power uh, in just over a week or so's time. Uh, that is it. So going to leave it at that. Let you guys get on and have a good day uh, and week ahead. Thanks very much.